beyond the uh, open spaces and, and workshops and whatnot, we're gonna have a, a really fun part of the DevOps Days experience, and that is Ignite Talks. Ignite Talks. Who here knows what an Ignite Talk is? A couple of hands are going up, so it's worth me maybe taking a moment to explain the format, which you're about to expect. Yeah, I'm gonna do it again. Chris. <laughs> So what's an Ignite? An Ignite is five minutes. No more, no less. It's exactly five minutes, exactly 20 sides. The slides advance every 15 seconds automatically, except in the case of the last Ignite where they're breaking the format, and I have words to say about that. But the idea is, is that it is very quick. It's action-oriented, and it's emotional. And guess what? It is hard as hell, all right? It's easy to get up on stage and ramble for 30 minutes. Trust me, I do it all the time. What's difficult is getting your message across in five minutes. And what's even more difficult is when you have to do it in 15 second chunks. If you ever tried to write poetry, yambic pentameter, haiku, you understand how difficult this is. And Ignite is part presentation, part information, but also part theater. And everybody who gets up on stage to do an Ignite is giving of themselves. So please. A round of applause for all of our upcoming Ignite speakers. It's you first. Yeah. So Dan, I got a challenge for you. Next time, yeah. you present what Ignites are in Ignite for me. <sighs> Meta. All right. Good luck, man. Hello, everybody. So this is the title of my Ignite talk, which will be started right now. Yes. Cool. So. While you're reading this title, uh, I just have to stay here and wait for nothing because this is the title of the talk. And what you see is what you get for AWS infrastructure. So uh, my name is Anton and uh, I've been doing lots of different uh, activities related to Terraform, AWS, and uh, many things related to cloud architecture as well. I sometimes blog and travel as well. So uh, I was uh, thinking for quite some time that uh, Okay, we have cloud architects. What is the uh, reason for this job to exist? They're supposed to help us with uh, designing and uh, helping during deployment or development process uh, of the project. So this is in theory pretty cool, right? But uh, then on another side of this uh, group or d defined team, I would say, is DevOps engineers. And we often can think that, oh, that would be cool if our DevOps engineers and cloud architects are doing the same things. So what kind of things do they have? Cloud architects typically design uh, AWS environment using one of these tools. So this is official list of supported tools. Everything is cool. In this talk, I'm going to focus more about uh, CloudCraft. CloudCraft is a tool which uh, allows to visualize these diagrams in the browser connect different properties uh, of uh, your infrastructure, and uh, you can specify different sizes, different types of resources, and then eventually you can export it as an image or PDF, or you can even embed it into some wiki, Confluence, and so on. So we are on DevOps Days conference, right? Where we cannot talk about how cool would it be to draw everything not as code. Right? Because uh, infrastructure as code makes DevOps possible. We have been treating application uh, for quite some time, and we know how good it can be if we test something before deploying. So we have to do the same things for infrastructure. And uh, here is Terraform. A bunch of public cloud providers came up with an idea that uh, we can uh, manage our own resources, while Ter Terraform can manage much more than that. It has more than hundreds of uh, different providers. So this is how typical configuration looks for the Terraform, where we have configuration of our resources, and then Terraform will put these resources into desired state. So it will, in this case, it will create S3 bucket. Over the course of last three years, I've been actively developing and maintaining uh, Terraform AWS modules, which were downloaded uh, approximately three millions of times uh, during the last three years. And uh, they turn out to be very reusable. So think about uh, what we have. We have AWS console where people uh, actually see a lot of things created. Sometimes they even click there and create their stuff. 
And then we have CloudCraft and other tools where we can actually visualize our infrastructure. We can connect, we can uh, enrich them in different ways. But then we have pretty separated group of people called DevOps engineers who actually want to describe this as code. So what can possibly go wrong, right? We use visual diagrams for one type of people, and then we have to convert it into another type of, uh, type of code or type of essence. In this case, I use Terraform AWS modules plus Terraform and uh, get this automatically. So welcome to Modules TF. Modules TF is an open source uh, infrastructure as code generator from visual diagrams. It is open source, written in Python, running on AWS Lambda, and uh, if you don't want to go through this extensive process, like opening free account and then draw and export, you can actually see the video on the previous slide. It's very easy to get started and get pretty solid code out of the box. You may also think like, yeah, we've been seeing this for quite some time, all these bootstrapping tools, which we, uh, not bootstrapping, but boilerplate tools, which we used before when we want to try something out, we run it for the first time, it produced something, then we look into it and didn't understand what is it and just delete it. Here I spent a pretty large amount of time to make sure that the information which you provided on the visual diagram is actually converted into potentially ready to use configurations which I would personally write. So as a small summary, I'd like to emphasize that it's really good to be able to visualize what we have using tools like CloudCraft and it's worth a lot of, but also don't underestimate the value of infrastructure as code and big open source community out there. Thank you. And yeah, it's actually a website. Thank you. I'd like to introduce, by the way, also our next speaker who flew here from uh, yeah, Netherlands or Belgium. Belgium. Belgium, yeah, for me it's pretty similar. But uh, yeah, welcome. <laughs> welcome. So my Ignite is about power your DC. And power as in not the power that you get in the electricity, but power as in the power PC platform. And DC stands for data center. So I, you, you see a lot of this bring your own device in companies. I like to use build your own data center because I'm an ops guy. I like building data centers. That's what I do for a living. So I like that. Um, PowerPC is actually a fully open source hardware platform which runs fully open source software. As an open source consultant, I, I like open source. That's why I like this platform. That's why I'm doing this Ignite about uh, hardware that is fully open source. So it's the open power with the open copy which allows us to have fully open source hardware uh, which can run um, fully open source software running from the uh, BMC to the actual uh, hard, uh, software layers on top of it. It's the Power 8 platform, now we are at Power 9. It's from IBM, but they have fully open sourced everything. It's not a, a typical SIS processor like your Intel processor. It's a, lit, it's a RISC processor, so it has a reduced con instruction set. Um, typically, it was Big Endian. Um, today, it is more little engine so that you can actually run most of the software that you knew from the Intel world. Um, in Intel, we have something called hyperthreading, uh, SMT, that has been in the news uh, last week. Yes. Um, it is, of course, very nice. Um, many people might be disabling it. Um, but in, mean, in the meanwhile, in, uh, AM, sorry, IBM has um, no problems with that. It had other problems, but not with this one. Um, Opal is the boot system, so that is the open power ad, um, abstraction layer, which actually IPLs your system up, so it's the same like a BIOS or a UEFI. Then you have Ski Boot, which is basically initializing all the hardware in the back end, and then Petite Boot, which actually is your uh, BIOS itself. Um, there's another project called OpenBMC, which, is, which came from IBM, and today is being used by 
companies like Facebook, Google, um, even Intel is thinking of changing their IPMI stack and their management stack to OpenBMC. Um, typically, you have two types of machines, scale out and scale up machines. Um, they come in one, two, four U racks and, and multiple sockets up to four. Um, some of the newer ones even have eight sockets on there. Um, yeah, a list of manufacturers. So you see, of course, IBM there because they were the original makers of the platform. Uh, but you even have Supermicro, Tian, uh, Raptor, Google, Rackspace, Facebook has started building their own machines. So you have a lot of them there. There's a lot of open source software around this. So Red Hat, of course, is the most commonly known. Suze was one of the older uh, distribution supported. Uh, Ubuntu, CentOS has one, uh, FreeBSD for the Unix people. Um, you have KVM and QEMU, Docker even runs on it, uh, Podman if you are a little bit more newer, um, OpenStack, OpenNebula. Typically one physical machine can run any more than a thousand VMs on it. So for larger uh, data centers, it makes sense to actually use these type of machines because the scaling is much, much higher. Um, most of the open source software today runs on it. Um, I, the, the slides will give you more examples, but typically um, the scalability and the actual threading is much more defined, so you typically can get much more out of your um, software than um, on an Intel or an ARM box. Um, MariaDB, for instance, can run up to 1 million transactions per second on this machine. Um, MongoDB is listed as a supported platform, um, but you see that most of the languages have um, support for this. Languages like Python, Ruby, which are um, uh, just-in-time languages, don't even need to be recompiled. Um, of course, if your uh, application is written in C, then you will need to recompile it, but that's about all. So you have support for all major open source software programming languages, um, and the density of these machines is much higher than usual. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. <laughs> a little bit of confusion here on the organizer's side. It's all good. Uh, it is volunteer. That's correct. All right. Please welcome to the stage uh, your friend and mine, Mr. Chris. Thank you, Dan. So I got told this morning, about 10 minutes before I got told and I had the introduction, that I had an Ignite coming. So bear with me as I wrote these slides during the first talk. And luckily, these are just a summary of what I talked on in London last week. Um, my name is still Chris, and what I do for a living is I help organizations to do this DevOps transformation. And in that, I learned a lot of things. And this basically is going to summarize back to a couple of things I learned. And that is that you have to start with infrastructure. Eight, nine years ago, I walked into an organization in complete chaos. They had no control. They had manual deployments. They had stuff all over the place and we learned how to do continuous integration and continuous delivery with them by building a CI stack for their infrastructure as goat. They learned to do Puppet, they learned to test Puppet, they learned to deploy Puppet and they learned how the developers could work with that stack. And they eventually built a platform that was reproducible that the developers could start deploying on. And they went from 500 different VD GDKs to just one and we learned them how to rebuild different platforms, like you have development, which looks like subseptance, which looks like production, and not something completely different. So because we did that with the developers, we're happy. We learned the infrastructure people how to do these things, and they were happy. They got where they wanted to go. And then I moved on to another project, which was mainly developers. Developers who were hiding CI infrastructure under their desk. They were building fancy stuff while not talking to the ops folks. And the ops were like, ah, we get crappy software from them. In that organization, it took me 18 months before I actually ran into the first ops person that I would even consider hiring. I was the first person who could tell me how this worked. But they were completely overworked. And we pulled them out of their ecosystem, put them in a separate team, separate building, and learned them to do exactly the same I did in the other team. We 
taught them how to do CI, we taught them trunk-based development, we taught them infrastructure as code, and they started building things. And even the old Greybeard AIX, IBM, Power Ops folks learned how to do CI, CD, and learned what it was to be agile. So that organization lost 18 months because they didn't include their ops folks in the first draft. Now, it can get worse. It can come to the point where you walk into an organization and two years into the transformation, the ops folks are nowhere there. They're a different legal entity in a different country and even the DevOps coaches are not allowed to talk to them. So, if you have an organization like that, the typical DevOps role, well, those people don't even get root access. They leave after two months. That organization was so bad that even their senior management left twice. And they got stuck with only in-house analysts and nobody actually doing things. If you talk to those operations team, how many of those tools do they think they know initially? Some of them don't do version control. Some of them have never run Maven in their life. But they're supposed to support the development teams. How do you expect them to do that? How do you expect them to learn what a development team is supposed to do if they've never done the same? So if you give those folks the same tools, if you tell them, hey, what about we do CI for the infrastructure, and you do absolutely the same, they'll learn how to use those tools. In the other way around, if you don't let them, the devs will keep complaining about, hey, I don't have a deployment environment. Hey, I don't have things to deploy, and I cannot deploy, and my tests are broken, I don't know why. And the ops folks are catching up. So start with operations first, because that's the only way that those teams are going to be able to understand what they need to support. They need to learn that code is code and how it behaves. And you can unblock delivery, you can unblock deployment, and that's a lot of challenges. Because otherwise, you're going to basically end up in the same ecosystem. Ten years ago, Friday, we got a tarball and it was, hey, put this in production. And now we got, hey, here's a container put in production. And the ops folk are still catching up because, well, there was a huge gap between it runs in my container and it runs on my stack. And that means you can get them onto the culture part. They can learn, they can feel the pain, and they can share their experiences. Um, this is basically the culture hack I want you to teach. Get the ops folks to set up CI CD, fully automated, infrastructure as code, and let them to learn how to keep a pipeline green. Teach them how to do so, and then you can keep the developers happy. And obviously, there's going to be more about that in Ghent in October. Mic drop. Definitely go to DevOps Days Ghent. If you can make it, it's going to be a grand event. Seriously, check it out. Our next speaker, who I actually have not had the pleasure of meeting personally. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm Sergey. Sergey, nice to meet you, sir. Me too. What are you going to be talking about today? We're going to talk about immutable infrastructure today. And I'm going to break the rule and speak in Russian. Wow, intense. Give it up for Sergey, everybody. Gotcha. Uh, ребят, меня зовут Сергей. Uh, попробую рассказать вам иммьютабл инфраструктуру. Вы, наверное, знаете, и большинство вещей для вас будет знакомы, но я надеюсь, что вы что-нибудь для себя вынесете. Итак, когда я думаю про то, что происходило 10 лет назад, я вспоминаю то, как было тяжело проводить мейнтенансы, и у меня ассоциация с этой картинкой. Uh, скорее всего, вот релизы, которые мы делали тогда, они были больными, сложными, технически, uh, и две вещи, которые повлияли на меня лично. Первое это инфраструктура за код, и вторая это иммьютабл инфраструктура. Собственно, возможность удалить любой компонент безбоязненно, это очень большое преимущество. Что это такое? Основные подходы. Мы ничего не меняем в текущей инфраструктуре. Например, мы не конфижим наши сервера, мы не меняем конфиги, не устанавливаем новое оборудование. Все, что мы можем сделать, это просто удалить какой-то компонент, который нам уже не нужен. На самом деле, если мы собираемся провести апдейт, мы просто вносим изменения в текущий код, деплоим этот артефакт, подменяем его и, соответственно, удаляем тот артефакт, который у нас был до этого. Если вы знакомы с докером, я думаю, что вы плюс-минус уже знакомы с этим подходом, вы понимаете, как это работает. В принципе, все то же самое. Если вам нужно провести какой-то апгрейд, конфигурацию, депо или еще что-то, вы просто подменяете текущий контейнер или текущий имидж, который вам нужен был. Но я бы хотел поговорить о том, что на самом деле стоит думать о чем-то большем. Что можно еще делать? Можно удалять целые кластера, можно удалять целые сабскрипшены, можно удалять э, структуру ключей. Например, мы у себя используем HashiCorp Vault и Terraform. Мы складываем все ключи внутрь HashiCorp Vault 
болта нашими скриптами. Работает это примерно таким образом. Если мне нужен connection контекст для DB, я его просто помещаю в HashiCorp Vault. Другим скриптом я его читаю и, соответственно, таким образом использую. Если мне нужно поменять всю структуру ключей, которая у меня сформировалась в рамках HashiCorp Vault, все, что я могу сделать, это всего-навсего задать параметр engine и его постоянно менять. Нужна новая структура, сделал новый engine, перенес все ключи туда. Причем мы делаем не миграцию, просто копируя ключи. Мы копируем ключи, которые помечены как manual. То есть у нас есть разделение ключей на manual и automated. Соответственно, ключи, которые manual, мы меняем структуру, ключи, которые automated, автоматом заполняются. Например, пример. У меня есть prod, потом название environment identity. Я хочу поменять в обратном порядке. Я хочу, чтобы был identity, потом prod. Таким образом, я могу в E2 структуре абсолютно безболезненно воспроизвести всю эту структуру ключей, которая мне дальше нужна. То, что я и сказал. Если я собираюсь это сделать, я должен разделить ключи изначально. То есть я должен сказать, что эти ключи у меня только manual, и, соответственно, ревью их отдельно. Автоматические ключи все приедут вместе с моими скриптами, которые я буду делать позже. Соответственно, потом дальше я запускаю скрипты в том же самом порядке сверху вниз. Я сначала начинаю с чего-нибудь широкого, то есть рбак роли, какие-то большие аккаунт white вещи, и потом спускаюсь к кластерам, сиквых серверам или еще чему-то, и уже потом контейнеры, аппликейшены. На самом деле… Если мы поговорим еще про subscription или аккаунты, что мы чаще всего делаем в subscription или в аккаунте? Мы смотрим за биллингом, мы смотрим, какие ресурсы они используются, мы смотрим за структурой, которая там есть, рбаки, ресурсные группы, и мы смотрим за тем, что же там вручную было сконфигурировано. Что если просто удалить этот аккаунт и не париться в следующий раз, когда нам понадобится еще раз произвести какие-то изменения? Выглядит немножко странно, но на самом деле, если вы готовы к этому, если вы это запланировали, если это вы хорошо провели, гораздо проще проводить maintenance, хорошо просто проще проводить скрипты и изменения, удаляя большие сабскрипшены и просто конфижа их заново. То есть, если у нас описано все в рамках инфраструктуры за код, как РБАК, ресурсные группы, все ресурсы, которые есть, то нам гораздо проще сделать новый сабскрипшен и в рамках нового сабскрипшена э, все эти вещи развернуть. Причем я вас не призываю делать это каждый раз, когда вы соберетесь менять что-то в рамках сабскрипшена. Просто подумайте насчет того, что время, которое вы инвестируете, вполне возможно, правильнее будет инвестировать в поднятие полностью нового сабскрипшена, чем попытки наведения порядка в текущем. Я надеюсь, вы знакомы с тем именем як шейвинг, да? то есть это потеря времени при работе. И, соответственно, мой посыл такой. Оцените это и поймите, возможно, для вашего конкретного кейса в несколько раз быстрее будет произведение. По крайней мере, для нас это часто бывает именно так. Часто бывает, когда выгоднее сделать все с нуля. Конечно же, immutable инфраструктура не подходит для некоторых кейсов. Если у вас есть SQL databases, если вы работаете с железом, скорее всего, вам будет очень сложно это произвести. Есть свои подходы, но, скорее всего, это будет сложно. Вторая вещь, у вас все должно покрыто быть automation тестами, у вас все должно быть написано в инфраструктуре за код, вы должны иметь полностью все, весь код без никаких ручных действий, для того, чтобы это было возможно, для того, чтобы вы могли достаточно легко переезжать между сабскрипшенами или аккаунтами. Собственно, я бы хотел, чтобы вы все подумали над этим простым каким-то подходом, на который на самом деле дает очень много и экономит очень много времени. И, возможно, ваша жизнь будет гораздо легче, потому что в следующий раз, когда вы соберетесь проводить какой-то массивный, огромный change инфраструктуры, вы просто все переделаете с нуля. Готовы подискутировать? Приходите в кулуары. Спасибо. Thank you, Sergey. I hope everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. I caught immutable infrastructure, so pretty sure I speak Russian now. <laughs> Next up, I believe we got Anton, is that correct, sir? Yes. What are you going to be talking about today, Anton? About infrastructure. About infrastructure, is it going to... Monitoring how we can cut. What language are you going to do it in? Yeah. You're going to do it in... Russian. Russian, fantastic. Yes. I get to increase my skills once again. <laughs> All right, good luck, man. Give it up for Anton. Thank you. Okay, всем привет. Сегодня хотел рассказать вам про мониторинг и как на своем примере, как он развивался, как мы пришли к такому его использованию для сокращения бюджета в использовании инфраструктуры. 15 секунд о себе. Работаю 13 лет уже в IT, 8 лет был network инженер и все вот это, а последние 5 лет DevOps. -ом. Соответственно, достаточно всегда и много использую мониторинг. А для кого можно использовать этот э, подход? Ну, в первую очередь, конечно же, двопсы, э, сырье, любые сес админы, техопсы, опсы, девелоперами, э, ну, вообще всем клевым людям. А, структура такая. Сначала, что такое мониторинг, для чего мониторинг, э, когда его можно использовать и э, как потом можно будет 
вот те знания, которые мы получили из мониторинга, использовать для сокращения бюджета в инфраструктуре. Почему мониторинг? Уже набил оскомину, но, как показывает практика, даже за последнее время не все еще полностью покрыли все свои ресурсы. Основная цель мониторинга – это предоставлять данные для анализа, которые вы потом используете в своих решениях. То есть нельзя управлять тем, что вы не измеряете. Поэтому мониторинг нужен абсолютно всем. Краткая история, как это у нас развивалось. Сначала у нас, когда я пришел, вообще не было ничего. Была черная дыра, не такая вот э, реальная, как хотелось бы, а такая вот черная, где вообще не было никаких метрик, данных, ничего. Как все работало, непонятно. Потом внедрили Zabbix, начали появляться какие-то уже э, графики, метрики, алерты, дашборты. Уже стало немного легче. Но с приходом новых м, проектов, новых компонент, Нужно было это все больше и больше покрывать. Внедряли новые, пробовали другие системы. И в итоге получилось куча и такое э, МЭС. Там подключали платные какие-то тулзы в виде э, New Relic, конечно же, потом ЛК для сбора и централизированных логов. И учитывая 100-500 разных э, лейеров, как тулзов, так и самих э, аппликаций, еще умножаем это на метрики, у нас просто получается э, глобальная такая куча мониторинга. Было решение сделать, э, как-то это упорядочить, структуризировать и такие сделать дашборды, которые основываются на лейерах по аппликации. То есть не у, усилять его, углублять, а именно основываться то, что нам нужно. То есть были выдвинуты такие реквайрменты для мониторинга системы, где было все разбито по лейерам и сверху мониторилось только верхний уровень аппликации, то есть жива или нет, а дальше опускалась. В связи с тем выбор пал на несколько систем мониторингов бесплатных. В принципе, любая вещь может мониторинг, не знаю, часы, это тоже мониторинг как для времени, но нас интересовало тогда open source решение. У нас был уже Zabbix, до него прикрутили графану для более классной визуализации, потихоньку внедряли Prometheus, потому что это уже сейчас в по факту стандарт для мониторинга и Cloud Native проект. И если надо с нуля, то используйте TIG. А как это влияет на публичные облака? Основная вот мысль, что публичные облака, как заявляет Amazon, это э, такое представление э, не то, что вы каждый сам себе генерите какие-то компьютерные ресурсы, а такая электростанция, которая вам придает те э, нужные ресурсы, за то время, которое вы ну, и платите вы только за то время, которое используете. Но нюанс в том, что вы платите за время, а используете ресурсы. Но ну, если вы не сервер да. Ну, большинство, я думаю, все компьютеринг используют. Соответственно, мониторинг э, настраиваете таким образом, чтобы триггеры, ну, по дефолту их нет, э, на недоиспользуемые ресурсы, да, на недонагрузку. И вы увидите, как на самом деле очень много ресурсов у вас просто простаивает. То есть это не очевидно, потому что мониторинг гораздо раньше зародился до публичных облаков. А вот это реальная картинка из Cost Explorer, то есть за 5 месяцев я где-то в два раза больше бюджет сократил. Просто используя ту информацию и те триггеры, которые выявляли для недозагруженных ресурсов. Ну, в принципе, это все. Большое спасибо, Антон. Told you I'm learning. <laughs> All right. Ooh, right on. Next up, uh, the inimitable Mr. Dan Barker. Don't even know what that word means. <laughs> Okay, if you were here a little bit ago, you know that uh, I am Dan Barker. I also write for opensource.com, and uh, I've written an ebook uh, about monitoring, uh, and we have gone retro and printed it. So I have some here today if you want to pick some up. So the uh, 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 first one is we'll cover which types of observability tools uh, are available. So we have metrics aggregation, that's really time series. Uh, log aggregation, that's kind of your eventing data. Uh, and alerting and visualizations. 
Um, that's kind of the interface into the human and distributed tracing, which uh, a lot of systems don't necessarily need, but that's very similar to your internal programming language uh, type tracing. So if you use um, Java or .NET, they have tracing systems in them. Uh, so for your metrics aggregation, uh, it's uh, really easy to get started in most cases. You can usually just install an agent on your regular host system. Um, and a lot of frameworks have it built in, like Ruby on Rails. Um, if you ever turn that on, uh, you get a lot of metrics out of it. Uh, for log aggregation, some systems uh, have built-in uh, logs, uh, but it usually requires devs uh, to actually code in some hand-type message of some kind. Um, and there are security risks of releasing confidential information. Uh, for alerts and visualizations, that requires more information uh, about the monitoring system, and it can cause negative impacts. So if you start alerting on issues that are not really uh, things that a human can respond to, that's going to disrupt that, that person's life. Um, distributed tracing, uh, a lot of times it's not necessary. Uh, you only need it if you actually have a distributed system. Um, and it's usually not built in and it's less mature. Um, so if you have a system that has a lot of disparate microservices, that's when you might want to use uh, distributed tracing. Who here knows about the debate of push versus pull? All right, mostly doesn't matter. Um, use either one. So you can either push your metrics in or pull your metrics in. Uh, I, think, I think most people agree now, hopefully, that it doesn't really matter that much. Um, maybe Chris will debate me on that. But uh, open metrics is a newer spec that's not uh, officially completed yet, um, but I would look for tools that support that or the ability to implement that in your system. Um, you should also use business metrics over other types of metrics in your system to decide whether something is successful or failing. Um, no one cares if the CPU or memory is high if everyone, uh, all of your customers are happy. Um, log aggregation tools are for logs, not time series data. Um, this is one of my personal pet peeves. Um, if it, th they require different storage mechanisms and different mathematical qualities um, to be able to uh, do the time series analysis. So please don't ever put time series in logs in a log aggregation system. So you should actually have logs, uh, and those should be in JSON format so that computers can reasonably ingest them uh, in a timely manner. Um, there's a lot of data, so it, it, it does take some overhead. Uh, you should include a timestamp, and that time should be in UTC. Please, for the love of God, put it in UTC. <laughs> Every single company I go to does it in their local time, and then you always have problems when you go to a new time zone, um, and that is disastrous. Uh, you should log all application errors. Um, if, if it's an error, someone probably needs to know about it. Uh, if you're not logging it, then you, probably not an error. Um, and you should also write them in human readable form because when someone is responding to these at 2 a.m., it's much easier to respond when it's something in plain text than some cryptic algorithm they have to figure out. Uh, log, do not log info uh, in data or in, in prod and uh, only log uh, significant events. Uh, and don't log PII. Please don't log PII. Yeah, I see that a lot too. Um, so Steve Martin said, a joke that works is complete knowledge in a nanosecond. And that's the way I feel about alerting and visualization. Uh, you should be able to look at a visualization and understand the state of the system just by looking at it. Um, there are no informational alerts. Uh, if you are paging someone about, hey, uh, this thing just cycled and everything's fine, um, stop. Please, uh, they're, they're, you, that's a notification, and that can be emailed to them, and they can find that later on. Uh, who here is sort of open tracing and open census? All right, a little bit. Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So I was very confused, still probably confused. Um, so open tracing is kind of a, a spec for uh, how, to, how to configure your tracing system and, and the different attributes of all of that. And open system has kind of, open census has kind of taken on uh, making some of the libraries and being a little bit more opinionated about that system. Um, but those are two things that I look for in companies uh, that are doing distributed tracing. Uh, here are some resources if you want to be able to see these. That first one uh, links to the ebook, um, and that's available here in retro printed form. Uh, if you want to take that, please feel free to. Thank you very much. I will, I will have them after uh, whatever break we have at some point here. You can just find me right up here. Très bien. Merci à vous, Monsieur Barker. Uh, C'était splendide. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Next up, we've got Victoria, who would like to give a big round of applause, everybody. Very good. Thank you so much. Hi. What are you going to be talking about today? Uh, 
we are talking about uh, how to beat oh platform. God, yes, take yeah, that yeah. Out of my sorry, hand. sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, I will talk in Russian because I will sound artificial for sure as Alexa. With, with definitely latency. So guys, I will talk Russian. Russian. Yeah. Mm, I know that guys made some excuse for me and slide will be for 20 seconds and not in 50 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Значит так, меня зовут Виктория, всем привет, я технический PM, сейчас работаю в Ринге, uh, именно поэтому могу шутить про, uh, про Алексу. Uh, да, потому что Ринг был куплен, кто не знает, кто знает Амазона. И о чем мы поговорим? На прошлом моем проекте я лидила создание платформы в DevOps, PaaS, да, Platform as a Service, и это уже была не первая платформа для этого проекта, это была третья платформа, и она заключалась в том, что мы должны добавить были еще один клауд, до этого у нас был Rackspace и Azure, надо было добавить еще мультиклаудность да, и добавить туда AWS и позволить аппликейшенам работать с докером. И было больно, было сложно, потому что рекламы, которые мы получили от наших бизнес-стейкхолдеров, звучали приблизительно так. Платформа должна не падать, поддерживать все языки, быть автоскейлабл, инфраструктура должна быть покрыта тестами и т.д. и т.п. Когда я посмотрела на своего solution архитектора который сейчас тоже сидит в зале, она такая посмотрела на меня и говорит, ну блин, это утопия, это что? И так как мы уже э, строили третью платформу, мы подумали, блин, а что сделать, чтобы не зафакапить хотя бы в этот раз? Э, и мы собрали все, что делали не так прошлые разы, и сделали из этого такие выводы. Почему строить платформу э, продуктов в DevOps сложно? Прежде всего, потому что когда вы э, обычно, ну, разработчик и строите solution, э, и делаете какой-то там проект для веба, у вас есть продукторы ну, черт часто, и все рекварменты, которые вы получаете, это functional в основном рекварменты. Очень редко, когда продукторы вам дает non-functional рекварменты. И они звучат э, часто так. As a user, I would like to have, да, и вы побежали. В э, платформе все по-другому. Платформа в основном строится на non-functional requirement, которые говорят о том, что у вас вы должны покрывать performance, вы должны покрывать scalability и security, и ну, usability тоже maintainability этой платформы. И это сложно, потому что, а, никто из стейкхолдеров вам часто не может сказать, что именно это такое и как это построить, и, б, ну, блин, это сложно, потому что если у вас продукт э, навернется, то это будет все в non-functional requirement. Еще есть, почему, боже, почему же так быстро, ребята, я понимаю, вы мужчины, ну. Держите, держите себя в руках, я вас прошу. Так, второй стейтмент был. А о чем был второй стейтмент? <laughs> да, да. Второй стейтмент был о том, что почему это сложно еще раз. Потому что toolset в DevOps очень быстро устаревает. Тоже на собственном примере вам расскажу, что у нас было с платформой. Мы решили для архитектации Docker заюзать ECS. Тогда все утвердили в этой архитектуре, пилили, пилили, пилили. В январе 2018 года должно выйти было на продакшн. И тут на тебе AWS в ноябре 2017 года говорит, что на рынок выходит Fargate. И наши конечные пользователи, девелоперы, начали ныть уже с того момента, что, ребята, ну какой ECS, давайте Fargate, а что такое? А то они еще про ECS не знали на тот момент. Поэтому сложно. И особенно, если вы используете open source э, проекты, ну, представьте, э, что вы, э, ну, и сейчас, наверное, очень много из вас используют Terraform, да, для Infrastructure Support, и тут ваш корт э, говорит о том, что все, ребята, не поддерживаем декомиссия. Звучит как утопия, но то же самое случилось с проектом HashiCorp Otto, там был слайд про это, но мы быстро промигнули. Они заинтродюсили в 2015 году, в 2016, через 5 месяцев уже декомиссировали этот проект. И почему сложно? Потому что ваши энд-юзеры — это девелоперы, это, наверное, самые э, требовательные юзеры, для которых вы строите платформы, и самые недовольные в итоге. Э, 
как сделать это легче, делайте, делайте демки и ну, показывайте результаты вашего труда и часто собирайте от них фидбэк. Потому что мы строим CI-CD для того, чтобы иметь вот этот быстрый фидбэк-луп, но он на самом деле нам нужен и от девелоперов тоже очень быстрый этот фидбэк-луп. Так что сидите в одном спейсе, не стройте стен и собирайте ну, пожелания от ваших девелоперов, и, потому что может быть такое, заюзали Kubernetes, а application так, stateful. Ну и как дальше работать, непонятно. Все, у меня все. Всем спасибо. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was uh, super fun. Everybody laughed, so it must have been amazing. Uh, fun fact about Ignite Talks is that they're five minutes long, so that's also really interesting. Uh, <laughs> just plugging you, don't worry about it. So our next speaker needs no introduction because he's me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're going to be in something a little different with this. My name's Daniel. I work for a company called Datadog, and I'm obsessed with time, and I'm obsessed with measuring things, and I'm obsessed with measuring time. So we're going to take a few minutes, and we're going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, spoiler alert, time is complicated. All right, it's actually really, really difficult. You ask the question, what is time? That's a really, really tricky answer, and a lot of people have spent a lot more time thinking about it than I have. So let's look at some of those definitions. The ancient Greeks had two words for time. Chronos, chronological time, as we might understand today, and kairos, which is the opportune or correct moment for an event to occur. In other words, time is both quantitative and qualitative in nature. Then along comes St. Augustine, preeminent medieval philosopher, tries to define time, goes mad, says time is a distension of the mind, made up of our memory of the past, perception of the present, and anticipation of the future. Time is all in your head. Then along comes Newton. Newton says, absolutely not, rejects that entirely, and says time is a physical dimension. It is around us at all times, and we move through it, and it moves through us, but it can only be reasoned about through pure mathematics. Interesting. Then along come Leibniz and Kant. They reject both of those things and say time cannot be measured directly. Instead, we have to use the language of spatial measurements and measure the distance between events and objects and compare those measurements together to form models of how the universe works. Space, time, do they share a relationship? Where have we seen space and time together in the past? <sighs> space, time. Space time, the stuff of Star Trek and first year physics students is made famous by Einstein's special and general relativities where he basically said that time is about the observer and the observer's perception and that observer's relationship to the mathematics that power the universe. Verse, 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 verse. verse. Time. So defining time is too complicated, let's not even try. Instead, let's talk about abstractions of time. Turns out we use abstractions every single day, every single moment. A fairly popular abstraction are clocks. Clocks are an interesting case because in the world of physics today, time is rather unambiguously, operationally defined as what a clock reads. If you ask a physicist to define time, they'll tell you to look at your watch. Pretty straightforward. Calendars are an interesting abstraction because they use the language of spatial relations to talk about time. For example, what is the distance between the 1st of January and the 1st of December? It's actually a harder question to answer than you might think. Then you have time zones. Time zones take it a step further. And they use the language of spatial distances to talk about time in a direct way. For example, how many hours are there between Sydney and London? Time zones are also non-Euclidean, which is really fun if you're into mathematics. Date-time libraries are an interesting abstraction, the bane of programmers everywhere, and they come with an interesting philosophical complication. If time is at least partially perceptual, and a date-time library is how a computer tells you what time it is, does a computer have perception? Word of advice, do not try to write your own date-time library. They're incredibly complex pieces of code, and beyond the philosophical implications of them, they're just really, really difficult to understand. PyTZ, the canonical date-time library for Python, has 25 open issues on it right now. 
the oldest of which dates back to 2009. Our David Murray, who writes Python language for a living, has this to say, I quote, I wonder if this is by design or by accident. In other words, the people that wrote the code don't understand it anymore. Another quote, do not assume that the network is reliable. In December of 2016, the global NTP network suffered a DDoS attack that made measuring time on the difficult statistic, on the internet statistically more difficult. It was actually a Snapchat update that did it. It's not the network I want to talk about. Kosovo and Serbia have a history with each other, and that extends to their electrical grid, which extends to the rest of Europe, and then they had a disagreement, and this agreement caused a tiny fluctuation in power distribution that caused time to stop in very small increments all across Europe, so that any clock connected to the electrical grid lost time. Microwave ovens and train stations, up to six minutes of time in some cases. In other words, time is complicated. It's political, it's philosophical, it's scientific, it's everywhere, it's nowhere. You can't think about it directly, but you can't escape it entirely. And if you love thinking about time as much as I do, I'm around for the next couple of days. P.S. We're hiring. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, that's why I was late this morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, no, no, trust me, I know time. <laughs> Guess what time it is now? <laughs> yeah, God, I wish. Actually, you know, you brought me lunch. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It's time for, this is actually my favorite part of DevOps days. It's time for open spaces. Who here has done an open space before? Right up your hand. If you were here last year, you did an open space before, so that's awesome. For those of you who weren't here last year, you've done open spaces before, great. You're all going to be helping me out. And you're going to be helping everyone else out here today. Because if you've done an open space before and you know how it works, you now shoulder the great burden of responsibility to help your fellow community members to enjoy themselves this afternoon as well. So I don't know if that's what you thought you were signing up for, but I just signed you up. All right. So.